started with this. It's a simple origami form. It's called a chatterbox. Many of us are familiar with these as we played with them as children. But I decided to make a robot from a chatterbox. And you can see the prototype here. It uses the chatterbox as the bloom for a robotic flower pot. You'll notice the top surface of the pot is actually a mirror surface, mirror reflective. More about why that's there later. But I didn't just make one robot flower pot. <laughs> I made many. And I networked them together into what I considered to be a collective organism. The work was titled Floribots. And it used that commonplace reference, that everyday domestic flower pot and the everyday origami to create something a little bit new. Here it is installed in the gallery in Canberra where it was first shown. There are 128 robot flower bots in Floribots and it's equipped with motion detectors and able to interact with its audience. And interact it did. In fact, I found that this work was the most engaging piece I'd ever exhibited. So I looked very carefully at the process of people interacting with it. And I noticed a key phenomena about the way that the work was behaving. It was actually exhibiting characteristics which had never been programmed into it by me. It was able to perform waves within waves, blips within waves, making sound compositions from the opening and closing of origami, all of which was unanticipated. It seemed like I'd created a being, something that was in some sense autonomous. To help understand it, I turned to complexity theory and the idea of emergence. A complex system can sometimes self-generate novel behaviours called emer emergent phenomena. To understand Floribots in complexity theory terms, I had to analyse it as a state machine. That is, a machine that can occupy so many discrete conditions. It turns out that Floribots can occupy two to the power of 128 states. That's quite a few billion, 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 billion. So perhaps there was sufficient complexity there to account for this emergent behaviour that I was seeing. So where to next? Well, I thought I'd strip away a lot of the characteristics of Floribots to see whether emergence remained. And this is what I did next. I built a machine called Counter, and it's very simply capable of doing just one thing. It can count the pedestrians who walk through it. It can count up to just under one billion. So in terms of its uh, performance as a state machine, it has up to a billion possible conditions. But more importantly, within those states, it's quite restricted. It can only increment by one. Floribots was able to change in multivalent ways. So it's a much simpler machine. But what I found was that the work was still quite effective at interacting with its audience. In fact, all three times when this work was installed in the centre of Perth, on the beach at Cottesloe, and on the other side of the world in Denmark, I found the same behaviour occurring. <laughs> I, I call this a pedestrian vortex. <laughs> it's a kind of barrel roll of people just going around and around clocking over the machine. And this is like a self-organising behaviour that happened again and again. So I think there still seems to be emergence here. Perhaps we have to regard the true scope of the system as including the complexity of the, the object and the audience. But I hadn't fully explored this possibility. There's a more simple still state machine that I could make, and this is my version of it. It's called Clockwork Jane. And it's very literally a wind-up ballerina doll. She sits on a mirror-faceted base, and she only has two states, wound up or unwound. The work is called Clockwork Jane, and it turns out that it's still quite engaging to its audience. I had people lining up to take their turn just to wind up the ballerina and watch her unwind. But I guess we shouldn't be too surprised at a work like this still being engaging because it employs a key device, that of anthropomorphism. It looks like a person. And as real people, we like to see things that look like us. So that's the simplest state machine I could make, but there's another wing of exploration that I could make. And for e inspiration here, I turned to an ancient art form called relief sculpture. 
Again, it's anthropomorphic and represents humanity. This example is from 3,000 years ago, ancient Greece. But I thought we can update the techniques a little bit. And here I'm shown collecting face scan information from 700 students at a school where I was acting as artist in residence. I used that face scan data to activate a machine I built, which I considered to be a variable relief sculpture. It consists of 256 mirror polished rods, which are independently motorised. The work is called Headspace, and it's shown here depicting one of the faces. It turns out that Headspace has 256 to the power of 256 different states. And that's more billion, billion, billion than I have time to tell you about. It's a huge number. And when the work was complete, yes, again, I noticed emergent behaviours. There was feedback between systems that were meant to be disparate. There were novel behaviours that I hadn't anticipated as its creator. But uh, it also turned out to be quite effective at engaging its audience, although importantly this time, mainly online. This work has been watched as a down uh, downloaded video by more people than have looked at all of the rest of my work combined, both online and offline. You should see in a moment, it coalesced into one of the facial relief sculpture portraits embedded within it. So where to from here? Well, it seemed to me there was something else to be investigated because all of these works sit either inside the gallery or inside a building where the duration, the time element that they can interact with their audience is kind of constrained. What if you could have an ongoing dialogue with a machine entity and form a longer relationship, I thought? Well, a work like that would have to be large so it could be you couldn't avoid interacting with it and it would have to sit outside in pedestrian space. I also thought going back to this uh, chatterbox, what would happen if you folded in one of these petals and made it a three-sided version? And what if you imagine these petals two metres long on an edge <laughs> and made many of these and wrapped them around a large steel frame? What you get is shown here on its transport cradle being delivered to site. It weighs almost 20 tonnes. It's now installed permanently at the Perth Arena. It's called Totem. It has 108 moving elements. Here are some of its different configurations. In this view, it's shown with all 108 elements deployed. In this case, I've moved away from figuration and representation to a purely abstract work, although the work has since been nicknamed the pineapple, so there may have been an <laughs> unintended representational reflection there. When the work is fully installed, I also noticed emergence in terms of the patterns of behaviours that the work was developing beyond my expectations, beyond my, the literal interpretation of how it had been coded to perform. I've also noticed in terms of its pedestrian interaction, there are emergent repeating patterns. People tend to orbit Totem as they go around it attempting to stimulate its motion detectors. Perhaps that's another form of emergence. Totem has two to the power of 108 possible states. That's quite a few billion, billion, billion. So it falls somewhere within the range that we've been exploring. But is that the last word? Well, I thought that notion that we talked about before of anthropomorphism had a little bit more to play. Not just in terms of creating something that looks like a person, but something that explores a little more about what it is to be a person. And to do that by a dialogue between a made being, a machine, and a real person. And to do that, I turn to what I call robot mythologies, which are well-known stories in our culture about the interaction between robots and people. Here are some examples. There's Pinocchio, the wooden boy who wants to be real. There's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the creature that becomes jealous of its creator. There's the Terminator robot from the future who turns into a surrogate father figure. There's Rachel, the replicant, who thinks that she's a real woman. And the oldest story of all is that of Gollum, the clay being from Jewish mythology who's brought to life by an inscription, but yet is itself unable to speak. 
But the story I chose is another one called Coppelia. Coppelia is a ballet. It's performed by ballet companies all around the world. It was first performed back in 1870, based on an earlier work by Hoffman. And in Coppelia, there's a clockwork girl who's mistaken for a real girl, and a real girl in turn impersonates the clockwork girl. And further, when you go and see a performance of Coppelia, you'll see a real-life flesh-and-blood ballerina who's beautiful and graceful, acting all ungainly and stiff, pretending to be a robot. I thought, what's going on here with these layers of one thing pretending to be another thing, pretending to be another thing? And to help me with this, I turned to the work of the French cultural theorist Jean Baudrillard. He came up with the idea of simulacra, he proposed first, second, and third order simulacra, copies of copies of copies. A key observation that Baudrillard made about simulacra was that as this stack deepens, the importance of the original diminishes. It becomes more of a level playing ground. So I thought, well, perhaps I could make a robot that pretends to be a real ballerina who's pretending to be a clockwork girl who's mistaken for a real girl. Perhaps we can go on to fourth and fifth order simulacra with this story. It, the other appealing thing about the Coppelia theme is that it involves classical ballet, which can be analysed as a state machine. It turns out that there are only so many permissible positions, for example, of the arms, which I'm investigating here with the assistance of Jane Smallers from the West Australian Ballet, and that although there are quite a few positions within classical ballet, it's not insurmountable to regard it as a state machine. I needed to build some robotics that were capable of performing these uh, classical ballet movements, and here an early prototype of a robot arm is shown. But I needed to organise the appropriate electronics and software to be able to capture and replay human movement to build this robotic ballerina that I intended to construct. You'll notice that the movement of this prototype is quite awkward and, and ungainly. That's because it's replaying my movement. If it was replaying a movement sequence by Jane Smallers, it would be beautiful and graceful. <laughs> so here in my studio, I've combined these elements and I'm gradually being bringing this project together. I call it the Coppelia project. It's very much a work in progress, but it kind of represents drawing together these threads that I've been talking to you about. So what are these threads? First of all, the idea of the commonplace, the chatterbox, the flower pot, the wind-up ballerina doll. Then the idea of emergence. From complexity, you can get novel behaviours that coalesce anthropomorphism, looking like a person, or more subtly, robot mythologies, engagements between real people and created beings. And then the notion of simulacra. And I think it's the final idea, simulacra, from which greatest insight can be drawn about our relationship with these created beings. I think Baudrillard's key observation was that as this stack of simulacra deepens, the importance of the original diminishes. We have to remember here that in this context it is us, we, who are the flesh and blood originals. So we shouldn't be too smug in this position. So I think when we look at a created being, we shouldn't just see it as a dim shadow of ourselves. I think a better way of viewing it is as a kind of mirror. So to some extent, these beings reveal aspects of ourselves. And ultimately, I think that it is us, we, who can see ourselves as being the Pinocchios, the jealous creatures, the speechless golems, and beautiful clockworks. Thank you. <laughs>